The first time we see the establishment of the relationship dynamics between Penelope and Colin takes place at Lady Danbury's ball in episode one, where Penn is watching Colin dance. This is a really simple yet very effective way of conveying a wealth of information. It is immediately obvious how Penelope feels about Colin, and this is due to a combination of the acting, the music, and the shot composition itself, the slow zooms in. The shot we get of Colin is effectively from Penelope's perspective and point of view, which also communicates a lot. It's a very romantic aesthetic. We see him through her eyes. He's smooth, charming, handsome. But we also see that the one-sided nature of this relationship is very evident as he's dancing with other women. He's in his own world. He's completely unaware that Penelope is even looking at him in the first place, which is the entire purpose of this scene. It foreshadows their dynamic of Colin being the only thing that Penelope notices and Colin not noticing Penelope at all, at least in that way. Another detail of shot composition here, there are people dancing in those shots that continually separate or get in the way of Colin and Penelope connecting or interacting. There are people coming in and out of the foreground, separating them physically from each other in the shot itself. The next scene begins when Portia says, Do not forget to bid Prudence, Philippa, or even Penelope farewell as you go. And this sets up the family dynamic as well as the social hierarchy. The necessity for a reminder to acknowledge the Featherington sisters in and of itself already establishes their lack of popularity. But even within that, Penelope is placed in the lowest possible position with the qualifier of even, as if it's asking a lot for them to even acknowledge Penelope's existence in the first place. Notably, Colin breezes straight past Prudence and Philippa, not looking at or acknowledging them, despite the fact that both of them are nodding and bowing to him as he passes. He goes straight for Penelope. Most wretched sonnet indeed. Lord Byron, he's not. <laughs> I do not believe so. This establishes that the way he does see her and regards her is different than everyone else. Not only does he acknowledge her, but he seeks her out specifically. The familiarity between them is obvious by the way they interact, and their intellectual connection, as well as their comfortability discussing things that verge on improper, is also evident by his witty insult his wretched sonnet indeed. and her quick rejoinder here. Lord Byron, he's not. <laughs> his facial expression in response to her little insult is interesting. There's potential surprise at her returning it, but also a sense of knowingness, like he expected that Penelope would say something like that. And I think this is a nod to a larger dynamic where they both know each other very, very well. They're very familiar, they're very comfortable. But at the same time, there is a lot about the other person that they really don't know or don't understand or have yet to see. He ends this by saying, Good day, Pen. which is the first of many times where we see that he almost exclusively calls her by her nickname. Again, nodding to their familiarity and their history off screen. The next scene yet again sees Colin approaching Penelope. We see this type of thing a lot. Again, they seek each other out. They almost can't help it. The way that they carry out social customs is interesting. It's both very natural and inherent, but also sort of an afterthought, as if their relationship transcends polite society. Pen. This aligns with lines like, you do not count, you're my friend, etc. He especially does not view her in that light. He does not see her in the context of being a lady, a debutante, out in society. We see the first of multiple of Penelope's attempts to gently guide him into viewing her that way with the comment about her dress. Mama would never allow me to wear a dress like this. And despite the fact that he does look at her dress and smiles when she jokes about it not being yellow enough, he still does not catch on to exactly what she is trying to get at. This is the first of many times where Colin's hero complex is engaged as Cressida comes over and intentionally spills her drink on Penelope's dress. How convenient. Colin is very observant in this scene, and I don't think he gets enough credit for that. He is paying attention to what's happening. He is looking toward Penelope. He is assessing the situation as it unfolds in front of him and deciding what the best course of action is. He's quick on his feet and quite literally sweeps Pen off her feet in this moment. I'm afraid I cannot offer you that dance, Miss Cowper. I am to escort Miss Featherington to the floor both to uplift Penn, but also to shame Cressida for what she just did in a generally polite way. He's not overt about it. He knows the social customs at hand, 
But in general, he doesn't like that type of person or behavior, and he's not going to reward it by dancing with her. He's also socially cognizant of what Cressida was doing, despite her assertion that- I did not see you there. But in particular, as he is friends with Penn, he wants to give her a boost, cheer her up, and take her away from this hostile situation. And he takes action quickly, both in word and deed, to quote unquote, rescue her. This also establishes their respective places in society and the difference between them, because Penn is somewhat of an outsider. She is lower on the social hierarchy, whereas Colin is much more popular, which lends itself to the dynamic that we've seen set up here of rescuer and rescuee. Penn in this moment is unstable and unsure. She's insecure, whereas Colin can just sweep her off her feet and look at her reassuringly and assure her that everything's going to be all right in the spur of the moment. He has the type of social capital and confidence that he can do these types of heroic things. At the very end of this dance, they flick back very briefly to a shot of Colin and Penelope, and I find it interesting that in the background, everyone else has let go of each other's hands. The dance has ended, but Colin and Penelope's hands are still attached to each other. This next scene is maybe the first scene where I think there is a difference in Colin. There's a shift in his perspective a bit, and that is the infamous What a Barb scene. Our host looks a bit fussy. Do you think if he goes to bed, we all have to leave? Colin, yet again, is seeking Penn out and approaches her with conspiratorial body language as he leans down to say his own barb. I was lucky the lady produced an air before the old girl croaked, no? Lucky indeed. He's actively looking to her to see her reaction to what he just said, and whether that's specific to Penn or just his charming nature, he takes pleasure in being a little scandalous, catching people off guard, it's hard to say, but he is absolutely saying this with the intention of getting a reaction from Penelope, and he is eagerly awaiting it as he watches it play out on her face. Again, the topic that they are discussing is somewhat scandalous as it's indirectly discussing sex. I was lucky the lady produced an air before the old girl croaked, no? Implying cheating from this woman. Lucky indeed. And discussing a bastard child. But do you not think the boy bears a past of resemblance to Lady Trowbridge's footman? They both enjoy observing and roasting to each other. It's not at all polite, but they can't help themselves. They like being on the sidelines, giggling, making jokes to each other, and pontificating about their observations of the ridiculousness of the society which they are a part of. What's a bob? In reaction to Penn's response, Colin's eyes just absolutely light up. It seems that he both is and isn't surprised that she said that, which shows a knowledge of her general wit, otherwise he wouldn't engage in and initiate these kinds of conversations with her. But there's a little thrill and satisfaction at actually seeing her vocalize these kinds of thoughts out loud. It shows a comfortability on her part with him that she's able to voice them. The way that he's looking at her shows excitement and intrigue that we really haven't seen Colin have for Penelope in this particular way. He seems to be looking at her in a bit of a different light. He just stares at her open mouth for way too long. He's almost daring her and seeing what she'll say or do next. He's waiting. Penn is the one who folds and breaks the eye contact here, but he keeps his eyes on her until the very last second when she is completely turned away from him. He is a little bit in awe in this moment, it seems. The adjustment he does here, he's shifting his body and licking his lips as if he's trying to keep the conversation going when it seems like she might be backing out. You can almost see his wheels turning, thinking of what to say next to keep her engaged in this conversation. As it so often happens in season one, a moment of potential genuine connection or revelation for Penn and Colin is interrupted by the interjection of Marina as Colin gets distracted, waylaying him from the sensible path right in front of him. I think the only thing Miss Thompson is interested in is a swift rescue indeed. I believe you're right. Uh, Colin, I did not meet... But it is important to note that this moment not coming to fruition or amounting in anything is on both of them. Penn got too overwhelmed and intimidated and she shirked away from it, which led to Colin's recentering his focus on Marina. 
The next scene is both unbearably cringy and simultaneously delicious. It's definitely humor driven as Penn is interjecting in Marina and Colin's conversation, trying to sabotage their relationship. Penn almost can't help but interject and try and put a damper on the relationship. It's like it's coming out of her involuntarily. She literally can't help it. Marina hates tomatoes. Colin is kind of under a spell of sorts and the music in this particular moment helps with this a lot. I love tomatoes. Colin. He's momentarily pulled out by Penn's doubt cold water on them, so to speak, and is a tad annoyed, but still very oblivious to why she's doing it, despite the fact that I would say it's pretty obvious. Though this isn't a scene directly between Penn and Colin, it is relevant to their relationship, where Penn basically says, he, he is my friend, Marina. I have known him forever. This lets the audience know that they are lifelong friends, they are childhood friends, and even more so than the book, they are really going with the angle of childhood lovers, childhood friends, family friends. They've known each other practically their entire lives. There hasn't been a life that either of them have inhabited that the other one wasn't a part of somehow. Colin is then shown to be very naive and susceptible to Marina's ploys. It shows his immaturity and his youth very clearly. He gets caught up so quickly and he's very quick to propose and he describes it as romantic. He's gleeful and giddy in this moment. Then marry me. I know we have only known each other a short while, but... Well, would you want to marry me, Miss Thompson? It's a rather long engagement. Or simply romantic. The next scene takes place at the engagement dinner party that they have at the Featheringtons, where Penn follows Colin outside and asks, Colin, might I have a word? Yeah, of course. And the way that he says it, it's so immediate, it's so visceral. It's as if he's saying that she doesn't need to ask. Of course they can have a word. They can always have a word. He's almost shocked that it would even be a question. Him grabbing her hand in this scene is very improper, but it does show their familiarity and comfort with one another. Him saying- You really are very good, you know that. Is unintentionally patronizing. It shows his view of her in the platonic sense. The fact that he doesn't even suspect her feelings shows how out of touch he is with viewing Penn in that way at all. To him, this is merely protectiveness, which he thinks is sweet, and that she's looking out for him. It doesn't even occur to him that it might be self-interested, or there might be an underlying reason why she's doing it, other than just being good old Penelope looking out for him. And again, it's like he doesn't see her humanity in its entirety, similarly to how Penn has him on such a pedestal that she doesn't see him in his humanity entirely either. The fact that her having ulterior motives just simply never occurred to him shows the way that he's preserved her in his mind as this good, sweet childhood friend. Him then going on to say, Trust me, Penn, do not fret, is very big brother rhetoric. His subsequent interaction with Marina and his discussion with Penn about his relationship with Marina reveals a few things. Marina is appealing to a yearning for purpose and control that he feels he's desperately lacking. And he sees her, their relationship, his rescuing of her, they're starting a family, them against the world, as the way to achieve this purpose. And he's very suggestible and naive about the tactics she's using to appeal to these vulnerable parts of him. It shows his lack of true self-knowledge and awareness throughout all of this, which preempts his journey of self-discovery later. The conversation between Marina and Penn later that episode also touches on their love being a childish infatuation and an unrequited fantasy. She says, If I am to be the executioner of this childish infatuation, then so be it. Your love is an unrequited fantasy. Colin sees you as you are and regards you no differently than he does Eloise or even little Hyacinth. Which is probably true. She probably is correct in that. She goes on to say, He sees me as a wife, a woman. And those are two things that at this point in time, Colin simply has never thought of Penelope as being. The next time that Colin and Penn are face to face, he literally skips a beat. And he has a stutter when he sees her, which I have always found very interesting and significant. It could be because he's embarrassed about the way that things have turned out and that Penn wound up being right about Marina. But given how familiar they are and how used to her he is, his startled nature when he merely looks at her has always stuck out to me as a very interesting tidbit from the finale of season one. At the ball, yet again, he is actively seeking her out, stopping everything once he sees her and approaching her. And whether or not he realizes that or it is romantic at this point in time, 
it does speak to the foundational strength of their love for one another as people. They feel comfortable with each other, and they see something special in the other that they long for and actively pursue. Though the scene is riddled with miscommunication and near misses, it really does establish that Penn does know him and his desires so well. This is one of the first references to her inspiring or encouraging him to pursue his dreams and goals, and he practically attributes all of it to her as she was there to remind him when he was getting distracted. It was actually you who inspired me. Almost as if to say that she knows him better than he knows himself at this point in time. She is his guiding star back to himself and what he truly needs and wants out of life. I also think this is one of many instances where it's very clear that Colin is not, in fact, ashamed of Penelope. He is asking her to dance. He's seeking her out. He's approaching her at all these events. It is also important to note that despite the fact that Colin hasn't connected the dots yet, he is seeing the dots. He can tell that Penelope is upset about something, and he's worried about that. He watches after her longingly as she leaves. He's worried. He's contemplating. He is wondering what's going on with her. And he's clocked into her emotions enough that he can see that change in her demeanor, even if he hasn't put much thought into why that might be yet. The first scene that Penelope and Colin share in season two is very interesting. And the fact that Penelope is not only the first person to see Colin, but also the first to acknowledge and take action as a result of seeing him is very interesting because she's the only person in the room who's not actually his family. Someone more like Colin. My brother. No, not Colin. Colin! Meanwhile, she's more active and excited about his return than any of his actual family is. And for his part, despite Colin seeing his family who he obviously missed for the first time in a while, his eyes immediately go to Penn and stay on hers for a while before they even start to dart to anyone else in his actual family. His first line of dialogue is, Glad to see things have not changed. This could be interpreted a lot of different ways, but... I find it very interesting because his eyes are geared towards Penelope, and once his gaze shifts momentarily to Eloise, he darts back to Penelope, as if he's saying this phrase with her specifically in mind. He's glad that Penn is here, as she often is. He's glad to see her. He's glad that nothing has changed, and that she's still a part of the family. There's simply no platonic explanation for what happens next. The slow push in on both of them is obviously a concerted effort on the team's part to nod to the future of Pollen, not only by both of the actors' expressions, but by the camera pushing in on each of them to emphasize these expressions. They're literally having a moment. And again, the fact that so much time and effort and energy is dedicated to showing Colin's joy and wonder at seeing Penelope again, when he's filled with a room of his family that he hasn't seen in a very long time, shows how important she is to him comparatively to the rest of the things in his life. This is a small, but I think very consequential detail. His family is giving him a hard time about his new look with the facial hair and tan. This strange fuzzy growth on your chin is no doubt some kind of disease. Mm, and right? you seem to have taken to the sun too. Hmm. How peculiar. But Penelope makes a point to say- I think he looks distinguished. I'm not- This is a dynamic that I am very excited to see them expand on in season three, but this seemingly innocuous little interjection from Penelope, which actually isn't even acknowledged by anyone in the scene, is very representative of a recurring theme both in Penelope and Colin individually and as a couple. This scene, in addition to many other moments throughout the seasons, establishes that Colin's family really doesn't take him seriously. They love him dearly, but they don't respect him completely. Colin even says this himself in season one, declaring that Marina was the only person who took him seriously. No one ever takes me seriously, except Marina. Which was one of the reasons why he was so taken with her in the first place. The perception of him that he's just this naive, flighty, charming boy, even from those closest to him, is something that bothers him, genuinely. Even with something as silly as facial hair, Penelope describes him as looking distinguished, which is an interesting choice of words in and of itself that describes importance and maturity to Colin that no one else is able to see in him. He's lacking that sorely and needs it desperately, and the one person who has always provided him with that, whether he's realized it or not, is Penelope. Next at the races, again, both of them are seeking each other out and prioritizing each other. He almost drops everything as soon as he sees her and approaches her as well. Pen. Oh, Colin. We did not get a chance to speak this morning. There's a very overwhelming sense of eagerness and desire for both of them to talk and interact with each other in this moment. They have already seen each other, which they reference, but they both are looking for each other. They both want to continue the conversation. 
Visually, the height difference struck me in the scene as he really is literally looking down on her in this conversation. And this coupled with the somewhat infantilizing wardrobe they have Penelope in in this episode in particular, hammers home yet again how and why Colin has yet to view her in a romantic light. Thought you would have been bored of my travels by now. You read and replied to more of my letters than anyone else. Showing the devotion that Penn has to Colin, even more so than his own family, which was also referenced in episode one when Eloise said that she had stopped replying to his letters. Again, Colin sees this, but doesn't recognize or even start to suspect the meaning behind it. There is always so much more to say than one can put onto the page. Is a nod to their shared method of communication being at its most genuine and intimate when they're able to articulate themselves free from any potential judgment from each other or anybody else around them. It also shows that Colin sees a side of Penelope that even fewer people have been able to see as this alter ego part of her personality, where she's fearless and witty and masterful with her words. Though she is expressive with Colin in person, this part of Penelope's personality being able to shine with regards to Colin is important. It seems that he incites a bravery in her that no one else has been capable of inspiring. And the method of communication through writing, her truest form of communication, allows her to express herself as truly and freely as she's ever been able to express herself. The thought and energy that Penn puts into the inner workings of Colin's mind and heart should be a dead giveaway, but regardless, I think that once Colin does realize what a rare quality it is and how she's the only person who cares this much, it will be very satisfying for viewers. I think he's going to realize that that, more than anything else, he's taken for granted in her, and that what he's always really wanted and needed more than anything has always been there, he just didn't see it. This is potentially the most complex Penelope and Colin scene that there has been up until this point, in my opinion. The wardrobe is interesting to note yet again. The styling makes Penn look very young and childish, which is perhaps reflecting the way that Colin views her through his eyes. So much interest shown in a young lady whom none of us really know. It's interesting that Penn feels comfortable discussing such a private thought of hers with Colin. It's the kind of thought that reflects more of the Lady Whistledown side of her personality, talking about diamonds, pontificating about Edwina, mystery, the debutantes, things like that. It's just not the type of thing that she would say aloud. It's the type of thing that she would write in the column, but she feels comfortable saying it to Colin directly, which does make me think that he might know this side of her more than anyone else does. Hmm. Not a devotee of mystery, Pat? Me? No. I'm always turning to the final chapter first. The line about Penn not being a devotee of mystery is said to emphasize the fact that Colin knows her very well, yet doesn't totally see her. I think the assessment is generally correct for Penn, but given the nature of what she does, it is technically false. It becomes clear how much Colin really struggled in the interim where we didn't see him. He had a full-on identity crisis. They never truly knew this person at all. Myself. And the fact that it was Penn who helped him even unintentionally during this time says a lot. I have you to thank. If you take a moment to think about what he is saying she did, it's profound. It was her and her words that gave him the desire to believe in himself, the courage to do so, and the understanding of who he actually is as a person. I thought, if Penelope can see me this way, then... Surely I can too. This is confidence, self-worth, ambition, bravery, and introspection, all unlike anything he's done in his entire life up until this point. And it was all spurred on by Penelope, and more accurately, the way that she sees him. This is a dynamic that I hope can be returned by Colin for Penelope in season three, but again, it is the way that Penelope sees him and the way that she is able to express that that allows him to know that this is even possible for him, that it's even possible for him to dream this type of life or to envision himself in this position, to understand himself in this way. You've sworn off women then? Not for the time being. I am a woman. You are Pen. Even though this is very controversial, to me, the immediate response of you are Pen has always been very touching. It's indicative of so many different things, all of which are positive. It shows the genuine love and respect he has for who she is as a human being. It shows the caliber he places her in, which sets her apart from all others. It shows the fondness and affection he has for her nostalgically. It shows the understanding that he has of her uniqueness and the reverence that he has for her overall. She transcends words and concepts as silly as these. She can't be placed in a singular category in his life. She's all of them and yet none of them. She's friend, family, childhood. There's no way that he can categorize or even describe her as anything other than pen. pen. 
who and what she is to him and all that that entails. It's reaching a point of connection where that person transcends labels and they just are who and what they are to you, which is more than could be described by a single category or label. It seems as though it's reductive, but I actually think it's much more complex than it might appear. You do not count. You're my friend. The you do not count line shows a bit more negative aspect of his, albeit esteemed, view of Penn, which is that while he means that she doesn't count as someone he would stop speaking to, it simultaneously gives insight into the fact that Colin simply has not and cannot view her in that light. The sweet part of that is that essentially what Colin is saying is that no matter what, she could never or would never be included in a group of people he was swearing off, regardless of whether she might fit there factually. Even if he is forswearing women, she's an exception to that because he can't imagine not talking to her or having her in his life. At the same time, this also means that he does not view her as even potentially ruinous to his objective, which is, in essence, to swear off romance. He doesn't need to swear Pen off because he's not in danger of experiencing those conflicting elements of romantic affection with her. His view is a bit of a double-edged sword as she is set entirely apart from the rest of society in his mind, but that also means that she's set apart from a place that she does, in fact, occupy in society. He doesn't think of her as a lady, a potential bride or wife. He understands, of course, that she is, in fact, a well-bred lady of society, but that's not the way he sees her, and nothing as of yet has challenged this view of her for him. The line, you're my friend, is a friend zoning, of course, but what I find most intriguing about it is the fact that even Colin cannot and does not identify it as such. To him, he's stating a fact. She's his friend. The statement, given how Penn feels, is insulting or hurtful, but I don't think that was his intention. Traditionally, you friend zone someone when you set a boundary to make it clear that their romantic feelings aren't reciprocated. But to Colin, the fact that Penelope even has romantic feelings, though painfully obvious to us, is completely unknown to him. I think this is yet another aspect of Penelope that he does not know, and she has not shown it to him. If you would simply open your eyes to what is in front of you, then you might see there are those in your life you already make happy. Who would that be? When Marina brings up Penn's name, he's dumbfounded and shocked. Penelope. Penelope. Again, it's never occurred to him. Of course, once it's pointed out to him and spelled out right in front of him, it makes sense. He starts to put the pieces together and go, oh, that's right, Penelope does treat me really well. She has always been there for me. But he has never once, of his own volition, thought of her in that particular way. I think there is an element of taking her for granted in the sense that she is a lot like family to him. She feels like a given. It doesn't feel like something that's a privilege or something that might go away because she's just always been there. It's always been that way. The scene where Penn and Colin talk about not dwelling on the past and thinking in the future explicitly references a few characteristics of both of them individually and consequently how they interact as a couple. Colin's inability to move on from the past keeps him unaware to what's right in front of him. Despite being told off quite soundly by Marina, he can't help but continue to spiral in these thoughts. He's an idealistic, romantic sort, not unlike Penn herself. But thoughts plagued by the idea of what could have been keep him from what is or what could be. He's very much in his own head and struggles to see the reality of things as they are, no matter how obvious it is. Penn is very overt in this conversation, and many others, and yet he remains oblivious. To no longer feel the need to forswear women. This conversation yet again hits on this dynamic of Colin's insecurity, his lack of purpose, meaning being counteracted quite fiercely by Penelope's belief in him. The more that I think about this dynamic, I really do think that Colin just doesn't see himself as good enough. It takes someone else believing in him for him to believe in himself. He doesn't have that inherent belief. Colin describes that he's struggling with a sense of purpose and comparing himself to his brothers in the scene. Anthony is to be married. Benedict has his artistic pursuits and here I am. Feeding the ducks. And then there is a shot to a swan, which may or may not be a reference to the ugly duckling and the swans, that old tale. Regardless, Penn is indefatigable in her support. She turns it right back around. Well, I'm sure the ducks are most grateful. She's making him see himself and things in a way that he never would have seen it otherwise. He is enough for her as he is. He doesn't have to do or be anything other than himself to still fascinate and thrill and enamor her. She loves him as he is. And it's so interesting because that is what he's shown over and over again he needs and desires most desperately in life. 
and he actually has it, yet he's not been able to connect the two. In their first interaction at Antony's wedding, Colin is engaged in a way that he hasn't been this entire season. He's been ruminating alone. This is the first time where this kind of thinking has challenged him with someone else. Perhaps she seeks to prove herself still significant and equal to the task. Is that not the plight of all mankind? This is the first time someone's been on his philosophical, introspective level. It's another iteration of the fact that he's so familiar with her, but there's also so much about each other that they have yet to learn and that they're surprised by. Eloise says, Do not indulge him. He's been insufferable ever since returning from Greece. Interacting in a meaningful or intellectually stimulating way with Colin is considered an indulgence in his life as it is right now. Penn is the only one who not only wants to do it, but just does it naturally. One must make a name for oneself. This life is to mean anything at all. A noble pursuit. Thank you, Pen. And that brought to mind the fact that I don't know that Colin feels like he really matters to anyone or has a significant impact on anyone's lives, which I think is why he jumped on Marina in the first place, and he's so oblivious to the impact that he has on Pen. I think he doesn't think he's good enough to have that kind of impact or to elicit that kind of response, the kind of love, the kind of adoration that Pen has for him unconditionally. I think he feels that he needs to earn it, and he hasn't done that. I am certain you will find your purpose one day. Have you found yours? <laughs> of course not. He's the only person that she has discussed any of this sort of thing with. Her greater meaning and purpose in life, her goals, her dreams, her aspirations, this is the closest she's come to the Lady Whistledown part of her identity being revealed. Her family is absolutely clueless to pretty much everything about her, and even Eloise, though she knows Penn better, is unaware of these grand dreams that she can openly and outwardly profess and declare straight to Colin without a second thought. My purpose will challenge me to be brave and witty. My purpose will propel me far beyond the watchful glare of my mama. Again, there is a lack of inhibition in their communications. They feel empowered and emboldened to be their truest selves with one another and express themselves to the fullest extent. Another thing that I noticed about this scene in particular is that she actually takes up space in the conversation and is active rather than reactive. Whereas most other conversations we see her in, She's doing her best to limit the amount of space she occupies or the amount of attention she collects. She relishes talking about this with him and is able to speak her mind in a way that she never does with other people. Any other time that Penn has expressed her true feelings on matters, it's been under her breath. It's been sneaky. You always do. I think he looks distinguished. I'm not, no, not of what you speak. I continue silence, you mean? Yes, I do feel sleep coming over me. How convenient. How can you tell her she wilting? Or punch, if you prefer. Plant pun if you're wondering. It hasn't been a loud declaration, but with Colin, she's able to do that. And you can even see the body language changes, the way that she pauses, the emphasis that she has on certain words. Purpose, she'll set me free. She's able to fully inhabit herself and her body in her discussion of herself and her life and her thoughts and her feelings, but only with Colin. That you would never forsake me. I'm beginning to believe that now. Goes back to the possible insecurity or inability to believe that he might be enough as he is for someone. You would never forsake me is such an interesting way to show his interpretation of what Marina said to him. Because all that Marina said is that she cares for you. And he took that to mean she would never forsake me. He has an inherent fear and insecurity that he will be forsaken if he isn't perfect. In episode 7, to me, it doesn't seem coincidental that he is seeking out obtaining and fulfilling his purpose in and around Penelope. It might be a happy coincidence, but again, I find it interesting that the possibilities of what could be and his inspiration to take charge of that is directly related to Penelope pretty much at every turn. I do think that there's an instinct to provide and protect that's underlying here, which is what makes it so appealing to him, as he says. Both our families will benefit, which is just what makes it so enticing. All of a sudden, there's been this reflection on Colin's part, which you can see Penelope breathe a sigh of relief. It's like she's been waiting her entire life for Colin to finally reflect on this and to finally see that she's been there all along. Our relationship has taken shape so naturally over the years, one could take it for granted. He praises her for her constancy and loyalty. You have always been so constant and loyal. Which, again, gives way to him getting distracted by the next new thing, the next shiny object. 
If Penn is always there and she's always going to be there, he can take that for granted easily. But now his eyes are open to the value of this kind of devotion, even if it hasn't translated into anything romantic. I do not believe I deserve such praise for my loyalty. Does something trouble you? Again, he clocks on that she's conflicted and concerned. He pays attention to her and is in tune with her in a way that many others are not in the slightest. Penelope can be pretty obvious about the way that she feels, even when she is not outwardly expressing it. And there have only been a couple times, really with Colin and maybe Eloise, that people have really clocked on to that and given her a platform to try and express what's wrong. In the finale of season two, he essentially orchestrated all of this for Penelope's benefit and on her behalf. He can't even fully keep his cover. He can't keep in character fully as his eyes are drawn to her. He wants to be a hero. He wants to be taken seriously. It's his younger brother syndrome. He wants to take care of people. He wants to feel that he matters, that he can protect and provide. Taking her hand in the ballroom is absolutely crazy, but I do think that it speaks to a couple things. One, she's Penn. He has such comfort and familiarity with her that he has absolutely no qualms about interacting with her in this intimate manner. This type of interaction, especially in the society, is largely reserved for family, but on the flip side of that, Colin, it could be thought quite scandalous for the two of us. There are no gemstone mines in Georgia. He does not see her as a woman. He does not even consider the potentially scandalous implications that could come as a result of this action. Then this necklace. Penelope, Mr. Bridgerton. What is the meaning of this? And number two, I don't think he's ashamed to be seen with her. They transcend social barriers to him and therefore in his mind don't have to adhere to those customs because she's just Penn. It's so much bigger than all of this. We're family. They're so inextricably linked and so inexorably tied together in their upbringing and their lives. Colin references that the Featheringtons don't have a father or husband to protect them. How dare you take advantage of these poor ladies, Featherington, without a father or a husband to protect them? And his hero complex is very apparent here. He talks about the fact that he had been I'm rehearsing that speech in my mind for hours. If your cousin does not return the money and leave your family alone, I will have another thing to say to him. You're astonishing, Colin. I cannot thank you enough for looking after us. He's on a high. He loves that he just did that. He wants to do it. He is like on top of the world, having just defended and protected Penelope and feeling like he made an impact on this person that he cares about's life. Him saying, I will always look after you, Penelope. You are special to me. He's not identifying it for what it is or what it will become, but these aren't feelings that can be expressed platonically, especially in this society. The desire to look after and protect her, her being special to him, I think all of these things are inherently improper. For better or worse, especially in the society, the person who looks after and protects you is your spouse, is your husband in this situation. So he's literally basically saying that what he wants to do is fulfill the role of a husband, yet again he just has yet to connect all those dots. I think he starts to realize and reap the emotional benefits of their relationship. He's feeling valued. He feels like he has a purpose and control, feeling a sense of responsibility. And he starts to have these realizations before he can actually put his finger on what it actually is and what it actually means. I think he's just come to the conclusion that he likes being around Penelope. He feels better when he's around Penelope. He likes talking to her more than anyone else. All these types of things that, again, he has yet to identify in any type of a romantic way, but in and of themselves, they are inherently romantic. There's lots of rhetoric that's used repetitively in the narrative arc of Penelope and Colin about fantasy, dreams. Childish infatuation. Your love is an unrequited fantasy. Dreams are grander than you let on, Pen. Mere fantasies. I would never dream of courting Penelope Featherington. Not in your wildest fantasies. I declare, Penelope. Colin is my friend. <laughs> as if he would ever waste his ink on someone like you. Colin Bridgerton is no more your friend than I am the next Catherine the Great. I suppose there is no use dwelling on the past. I am indeed thinking of the future. Everyone else is finding some purpose to their lives. One must make a name for oneself. This life is to mean anything at all. I am certain you'll find your purpose one day. By purpose, she'll set me free. It is a chance to make a name for myself. You need to wake up, Colin. I think there might be some foreshadowing for future events, potentially with dreams in season three. There's just a common recurring theme of fantasies, dreams, in your head, it's made up, wake up, 
reality. It's very interesting how that continues to be a theme in the relationship of Colin and Penelope. As for what Colin says at the end, I don't know exactly all the reasons why he said it. But again, I think he just is in a very strange point where he's starting to appreciate so much of what Penelope provides, but he has yet to place his finger on what it actually is that they're doing, what type of relationship they actually are enacting. But the bottom line is that I think he loves her. I think he always has. Whether or not that's in a romantic way, I think he likes who she is. I think he has the best time with her. I think he feels better with her than with anyone else. And he has always seen her. He might not have seen her in a romantic or a sexual light, but he has seen her. He has valued her when nobody else has. And I think it's a reciprocal dynamic with Penelope. She has valued him and seen him when nobody else has as well. I'm really excited to see where all of this goes in season three because I think there's a lot of really interesting and complex and complicated dynamics that have already been set up for them. And I can see a progression. I can see a shift of the power dynamics, Colin becoming less confident, Penn becoming more confident, the feelings kind of becoming unrequited seemingly from Penn's side and Colin is the one pining and longing and yearning. Again, so much of it does seem to be wrapped up in timing because they're so close at certain points in season two, even hints of it in season one. And it's like if they could just get this together, if they could just see each other as human beings, if they could just know this about each other, if they could just understand this, then they would be able to be together. And I think that's literally the whole setup for season three, and that's exactly what it is. It's engineering all these different elements to get everything aligned in the right way so that they can have the healthiest, happiest relationship that they possibly can. But there's just so much. I mean, it's an unrequited love. It's a she fell first, he fell harder. It's a friends to lovers. It's just so many different things. It's so many different tropes. There's so many different dynamics. I can't even begin to think about the possibilities of what they could explore because I actually think there's so much that they could explore in season three and I doubt they're going to do a lot of it. But there's just so many interesting things having to do with perspective and their love and adoration for each other as people while also their simultaneous ignorance to the full breadth of the other person as a human being. All of it just is very psychologically complex and interesting. Let me know what you think of this analysis. Let me know your own thoughts, your own analysis of Penelope and Colin's relationship, and I will see you for yet another Bridgerton video again very soon.